Everyone would probably agree that the sports world is just a better place when Tiger Woods is playing well and winning majors. His recent win at the Masters just reminded us again of how much he's had to overcome in particular in relation to his many injuries and his back surgeries. Welcome back everybody for those new, my name's Brian and I'm a doctor and a sports fan and it's my goal here to combine those interests to explain different sports injuries and sports medicine topics in a way that's easier for you all to learn from and understand. In this video, we'll take a look at his back surgeries, mainly the fusion that he had. We'll talk about why he had a procedure like this. We'll talk about what they did in the procedure, the advantages of this specific type of fusion compared to others. And then we'll talk about what it means for his golf game. Everybody hears that Tiger has had his spine fused and they think, how is it even possible for him to play golf? But what we'll do is we'll look at the overall range of motion and biomechanics of the spine to explain why it might not be that surprising that he's actually able to still do what he needs to do for a golf swing. Make sure you hit that subscribe button to stay up to date if you guys like these videos and want to see more in the future and let's get started. Briefly to address the micro discectomies that Tiger had before his spine fusion, Let's first take a look at our spine anatomy model. Here we have a rough representation of our lumbar and our sacral spine. These spinous processes are in the back and then these vertebral bodies are in the front with our abdomen and our abdominal organs right here. Down on the inside we have our yellow spinal cord and then we have all of our nerve roots coming out of the neuroforamen between those vertebral bodies. We then have our discs and these are what are implicated when someone has a micro discectomy. Over time for various reasons, but commonly with excessive load on the spine, portions of these discs can actually kind of herniate and bulge outwards. Similar to the analogy of the jelly inside of a donut, some of the jelly can get pushed out. When that happens, if it's in the right location, it can actually pinch on these nerve roots in the spine causing pain, causing weakness in whatever pattern those nerves are traveling. One of the most minimally invasive surgeries they can do is a micro discectomy where they basically go in and they clip out the part of the disc that seems to be pinching on the nerve. As we saw though with Tiger Woods, sometimes these can recur and he ended up, I believe, having multiple of these micro discectomies. So then what do you do if things continue to progress to the point where you're still having severe symptoms? That's where the fusion comes in. Tiger tried all kinds of things to manage these symptoms before he had the fusion. He tried injections, he tried therapy, did all the appropriate stuff to try to control his symptoms, but he was having so much irritation on those nerves that it wouldn't go away. The specific area that Tiger had his fusion was between the L5 and the S1 vertebra. So L5 is the lowest lumbar level, and then S1 is the highest sacral level. Over time, because of damage to that disc, that space gets narrower and narrower and collapses down to the point where you get even more pinching and damage on those nerves. The biomechanics of your spine get all screwed up, and so then the more you're moving, the more those vertebrae are moving, the more damage and irritation you have on the nerves. So the goal of the fusion surgery is to restore some of that disc height or disc space and remove the pressure off of the nerves. There's a lot of different ways they can do this, but the particular one that Woods had done is something called an ALIF, or an anterior lumbar interbody fusion. Anterior means from where they approach, so for this type of fusion, they actually come in through the abdomen instead of through the back, which has advantages we'll talk about in a bit. Lumbar interbody fusion means they're trying to fuse two of the lumbar bodies. Like I said, these can be done from a lot of different approaches. The kind of traditional old school way is a posterior fusion where they come through the back muscles and they fuse on the back side of the spine. The problem with that though is you have to cut through the muscles of the spine and so you can have a lot more damage to those muscles, which for someone like a professional golfer like Woods, you really rely on those back muscles to play. With an anterior approach, you have to go through all the abdominal organs and so you have your own risks with that, but you're able to spare those main structural stabilizers and support muscles of the lumbar spine. So a huge advantage for someone who's playing golf to do this anterior approach instead of the posterior. In the case of Woods, what they did is they basically fused his L5 to his S1. They put material in where the disc would be to restore that disc space, and then they put a plate over the L5 and the S1 vertebrae to make them fuse so they essentially act as a single bone. That allows the pressure to be taken off the nerves and hopefully relieves the pain and symptoms like it did with Woods. So we think, well, someone's had a spine fusion, how is it possible they can play golf? You've gotta do a lot of bending, you've gotta do a lot of twisting, how can you do that with your spine fused? First of all, remember here, Woods just had two levels fused together, his L5 and his S1. So it wasn't like his entire spine was fused. If that had been the case, probably wouldn't have come back to golf. He would have been much more limited with range of motion. But what I wanted to take a look at is explain the different range of motion in the spine to give you a sense of why there's not as much impacted when you fuse just this lower level. In our cervical spine, we have lots of mobility to do kind of this lateral rotation where we move side to side. 
We can also flex our neck down, we can extend our neck up. And then similarly in our thorax, we again, we can move a lot rotationally about our thorax and bending over to the side. I'm gonna make our lighting a little darker so we can see, but when we look on the back of the lumbar spine, we have a lot of flexion and extension in the lumbar spine. So able to arch our back in extension and bend forward. But we don't have very much rotation or twisting in the spine. And that's because of these facet joints in the back of the spine. You can tell whenever I try to turn, there's basically these hard stop points where because of how these bones are shaped, they can't spin on each other. They just structurally run into each other. Now you do have a lot of lateral bending mobility, so that ability to kind of go to the left, go to the right, but there really is only a few degrees of that rotation in each level of the lumbar spine. So with a fusion, particularly of just one level, you're really not losing that much in terms of your rotation or your twisting like you might need for golf. And even without the fusion, like I said, there's not that much rotation that occurs in the lumbar spine. There's much more flexion, extension, and kind of side to side lateral bending. So when Tiger goes to swing a golf club, the fusion itself shouldn't necessarily be providing all that much restriction in terms of what he's able to do with his range of motion. What we have to address with the fusion though is how it negatively affects the biomechanics of the spine. The spine is really intricately designed to maintain and support all this different load based on the different segments in the spine. You have this big massive load and you're trying to distribute it to all these individual bones or vertebra. And if you fuse or take away one of those, then suddenly there's a higher amount of load that has to be carried by the rest of the levels. We know in general that low back injuries are extremely common in golfers because of all the insane load that you're putting on your back. If you think of someone like Tiger going through a golf swing here, basically they start out, they're twisting at the shoulders and the pelvis stays relatively straightforward on that backswing. But then whenever you come through, you're swinging your hips through towards your target and then getting all of that torsional energy translated through your spine. And so there's insane amounts of load on the entirety of your spine, but in particular that thoracic and lumbar level. With spine fusions, we worry about this thing called adjacent segment disease, or basically damage that can happen to the segments above and below your fusion because of how you've changed the biomechanics. The real big thing to keep in mind for Tiger here isn't necessarily how he's gonna do today or tomorrow, but what could develop and happen in his back five years down the road, 10 years down the road, because of how this fusion changes his spine's biomechanics. If you have five lumbar vertebra carrying the support in your lumbar spine and you fuse two of them together, now you essentially have four lumbar vertebra that are trying to carry that same load. So you now have more load distributed to those individual ones, which puts them at more risk of degeneration, wear and tear, and injury. It's not too uncommon for people to have to have their fusions extended over time because of that idea of this adjacent segment disease. Now, while there's no clear cut consensus on kind of a return to play approach for golfers after spine fusion, in general papers have sort of polled or surveyed neurosurgeons, and they say that for a lumbar fusion around six months is kind of a common time where people can start getting back into their normal activities and thinking about picking up golf again. But most people from literature, both professional and amateurs who have lumbar spine fusions actually get back to the same handicap they were at before their surgery. So this isn't something that drastically alters their level of play. Like I said, it's more about the long-term implications of how the biomechanics and loading in your spine are gonna be different because of this fusion. This whole kinetic chain though of how everything is transferred with a golf swing is part of why you oftentimes see knee injuries and back injuries and hip injuries in golfers because everything has to work together in this really high load absorbing system. So it wouldn't be surprising down the road if we see kind of some additional hip, some additional knee stuff, or even some further back strains with Tiger just because of how his body mechanics are now altered. But anyways, thanks as always for watching everybody. I hope you all learned something about Tiger's procedure, some basic ideas of biomechanics of the spine and kind of what implications there are when we have a spine fusion. Let me know questions, comments, thoughts below. And until next time, thanks for watching and we'll see you later.